So we're just going to jump right into our first panel, which is about the importance of creating better urban food systems. Urban farming is increasingly important around the globe. Nearly one billion people are farming empty lots, rooftops, backyards, and balconies from D.C. to Nairobi. While so, for some, urban gardening is a fun hobby, for thousands and thousands of others, it's a necessity. And many policymakers are realizing the importance of cultivating better urban food systems that meet the needs of urban eaters. That's why I'm especially uh, honored to introduce our keynote, DC Council Member Mary Che, who is leading DC's efforts to improve access to affordable and nutritious food. This panel will be moderated by Dennis Dimmick, the executive editor of National Geographic magazine, who has led the magazine's efforts over the last several months to feature food and agriculture issues. I'm such a huge fan of Dennis and his work and incredibly honored that he could be with us today. So please join me in welcoming Councilwoman Che to the stage, who will be followed by Dennis and then our group of amazing panelists. Uh, Mary, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today, so good morning, everybody. I'm happy to report that the District of Columbia is on the cutting edge of innovative food policy. We've passed ambi ambitious legislation uh, and have had uh, multiple initiatives to expand access to nutritious food, to fight hunger, to build a local food economy. But I'm also happy to note that the government has been able to join hands with groups like uh, this and others, because we have to do this all together. Um, in terms of what we've done on the government level, uh, we've been able to ensure uh, progress has been able to go forward. We've been able to pass significant pieces of legislation. And I want to thank uh, Food Tank uh, for giving us the chance to have this interaction. Because the fact of the matter is, we are doing much more on a local level than could ever be done sort of nationally with a single policy. The uh, initiatives that we're engaging in are really crafted for local economies, and they're uh, adapted to local economies, and they require local solutions, though we will interact with one another, and we will grow from one another by getting ideas from, from each other. Um, We've done an awful lot in the District of Columbia, but what we've done started out, uh, in my own case, uh, with the district, uh, sort of um, in a narrow sense. I was, uh, when I was first elected in 2006, I began to notice more and more the issue about obesity among children. When I would go to schools, I would see the, the children in the schools when I would go out you know, to look at some uh, bad housing, because I had jurisdiction in that area, I noticed that kids during the summer were inside, you know, and there was one particular vision that st has always stayed with me. We went into this very dilapidated house, and there was a door open uh, to the living room, and you could see into the kitchen and the living room. In the living room were three children, all of whom were about under the age of seven. And this is in the middle of the day, and the sun is shining, it's beautiful outside. And they're set up in front of the TV with a, a big gallon of soda and a big bag of chips. And I could see into the kitchen, and there was a, an elderly grandmother who herself was quite overweight. And I said, you know, we have to do something about this. So in the District of Columbia, my focus was on healthy schools. So I passed the Healthy Schools Act, um, which was an omnibus piece of legislation that has many moving parts. But first and foremost, it raised the nutrition level of the meals in schools. But it also reintroduced real physical education. It had nutrition education. It had school gardens. It had farm to school networks that were created. And in terms of the school gardens, I have to tell you, each year we have an essay contest. And we have kids write essays about what it means to them to work in the garden. And it, for example, Janney Elementary, not only do they have a garden, but they're raising chickens. Um, I was there for lunch, and a side dish that we had was um, mashed sweet potatoes that the children themselves put in the ground, harvested, and then we served them in the cafeteria. When they write these essays each year, 
I'm telling you, I actually tear up because they talk about how meaningful it was to them, and in their own, you know, small way, philosophically, you know, um, empowering for them to re-engage with the earth. Now, that Healthy Schools Act um, was followed by a number of pieces of legislation. Uh, I'm happy to say that I'm the author of most of them. Um, we have the Feed DC Act. It creates a healthy corners program to bring fresh produce to corner stores. Um, it also provides for food carts, you know, at subway stations and, and bus stations. We passed the Healthy Parks Act, applying these rigorous nutritional um, requirements uh, in parks as well as in schools. The Sustainable DC Act allows beekeeping in the district. The Cottage Food Act allows small based food businesses to safely sell their baked goods without going through the expensive, time consuming and extraordinarily bureaucratic uh, food production license ordinarily applicable. The council directs money uh, in the budget to double the value of SNAP benefits at farmers markets. Last year, the council also passed, I'm totally into this uh, titling here, the Healthy Tots Act, um, which applies rigorous nutritional standings, uh, standards rather, uh, to early child care centers. Uh, and in all of these ways, we've been building a food policy, but the legislation has been somewhat piecemeal. And so uh, to sort of give it a comprehensive uh, approach to make it more robust and to be able to connect with other entities that are uh, at work in this area as well, um, I decided that we needed something broader. And so I introduced in the council passed the Food Policy Council and Director Establishment Act. Uh, it was just a few months ago. It creates a Food Policy Council and a director who will advocate for positive food policy within the district. And the idea is to take a comprehensive approach to improving our local food system by increasing access to healthy food, supporting our local food economy, and working with the larger community so that we can integrate our efforts. So we want to have a broad, expansive, comprehensive approach to food policy in the District of Columbia. And we want diverse representation on this uh, a board. Anybody available, uh, let me know. Um, and we will divide it into different working groups so that we can look at the whole picture. Now, in terms of that whole picture, sustainable urban agriculture is a key ingredient. And we have uh, passed legislation that uh, you know, requires the government to identify vacant lots that could be candidates for uh, growing food. We've also tried to uh, give incentives to folks for their community gardens and for uh, more you know, um, extensive food production in the district. There are all sorts of things that are possible. Growing food on roofs, growing food you know, along uh, uh, public ways, hydroponics, the possibilities really are um, extraordinary, and we need to exploit them. The um, issue about food policy has to be one that we are all engaged in. And in fact, I'm surprised that we haven't paid more attention to it uh, until now. Food deserts, access to food, and it helps the, uh, you know, the, the local economy. In terms of you know, what we're doing and where we're going, the fact of the matter is that, as I said before, we need to sort of cross-pollinate, to use that expression, among ourselves. Because, as I said, it is largely a local initiative. It spans the globe, but it's locally active. And so each area is doing some things that maybe another area could learn from. And that's why this, this engagement is so important. The District of Columbia and cities in the United States and around the world are having, I would say, something of a renaissance. In the District of Columbia, for example, although it's slowed somewhat, we have been net netting, and I mean netting, a thousand people coming into the district every month. That means that we are now the center, really, of innovation among people who want to come and live in cities. And part of that has to be our food policy. So I hope throughout today and tomorrow, and I want to thank Food Tank, and I want to thank the George Washington University, where, by the way, I'm a law professor. Um, <laughs> just thought I'd mention that. Um, I want to thank them for bringing you, all of you together. And when you all get together, we're all going to be enriched. So this is very exciting, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that I was able to be a part of it. Thank you very much.
Thank you all for being here. Um, our uh, goal today is to talk about cultivating better urban food systems. Now, as a uh, young man, I grew up on a farm out in the country in Oregon, and that's where I thought food was grown. And then people in the city ate the food that the people in the country grew. So now we're actually thinking about actually trying to improve uh, food production close to where the people live and actually also reconnecting people to the food that they eat, understanding where it comes from. And so what we have here today is a tremendous group of very knowledgeable individuals. I'll, I'll introduce all of them and then we'll come back and have a, a, a brief discussion with each of them about what they do and their challenges and successes. And then we'll have a discussion amongst ourselves and then the goal is for the last 20 minutes or so to have a open discussion with all of you here and all of you out there in the great virtual world connected. So we have to my left immediately Che Axum of the University of the District of Columbia. He's the director of the Center for Urban Agriculture and Gardening in the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Sciences, right? And UDC is a land grant university. Uh, to his left is Morgan Morris of Love and Carrots, a DC-based organic farming advisory organization. If you're interested in gardening and don't know how to go about starting it, she is a good person to talk to. We have uh, Thomas Forrester, uh, of, who is a food and agriculture policy expert at Eco Agriculture Partners. He has been specializing in this area recently on the idea of uh, city region food systems. We'll get into that. Uh, next to him is Ivy Ken of the George Washington University Urban Sustainability Project. She's an associate professor of sociology and she is very focused on the idea of improving food in the school. And to her left is Helen Dombalis of, she is the Policy and Strategic Partnerships Director at the National Farm to School Network. Uh, to her left is Haley Burns. Haley is a George Washington University senior who serves on GW's Urban Food Task Force and is working hard to improve the food landscape for students here in DC. And uh, on the end, Last but not least is Tom Colicchio, who is a chef, uh, a recipient of five James Beard Foundation medals, an author, founder of Food Policy Action, and also somebody who is uh, changing the landscape of food production in the city where he lives, New York City. So Che, so you are on the ground, you're involved in education and research. Why don't you talk to us about the work that you have at UDC. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, you know, UDC is the, one particular thing about UDC is it, it is an urban, uh, it is a land grant university, but it's the only urban land grant university. So we have a very particular mission to address the needs of urban residents. So um, we also have a 143 acre farm in Bellsville, Maryland, which um, I take part in. And also, we are starting off a um, huge campaign for our huge square foot green roof on top of Building 44 on campus. And um, so uh, the interim president, Dr. Lyons, and also the dean of the College of uh, Ag, uh, Dr. Sabina O'Hara, have given me a mission to see that urban food production is enhanced in the District of Columbia through many different ways, through um, training, educational courses, and also demonstration courses at the farm. So we're doing quite a bit. And we have a huge, huge task ahead of us because right now we have about a billion people, um, you know, suffer from chronic hunger. But uh, as uh, Dr. Madigan so eloquently uh, said earlier, you know, in about 20, 20, 2050, we're going to have about a two to three billion probably added on to that. So that's when things really get tight. So we really have to work on producing, increasing yields, and all kinds of things, so. So, Che, specifically about uh, uh, the District of Columbia and, and, and the farm that you have, what are the specific kinds of 
of crops that you're uh, focused on that can benefit uh, people here and, mm -hmm. and also talk to us about the educational part of it. So if I were a student at, at UDC, could I major in agriculture or get a certificate? What is Well, you, you could get a certificate. You can't really major because the courses aren't really set up, but we're, gearing, we're getting toward mm -hmm. that. But, um, you know, you talked about crop selection. Um, as a past organic farmer and as an agronomist, um, I've always looked at growing Yields are important when you're growing food. Yields are very important, but also nutrition per acre is extremely mm -hmm. important. So one of the things that we're really doing at UDC <laughs> and implementing, looking at crop varietal selections and selecting crops for high nutrient density. And then also we're doing experimentation with increasing nutrient density of food crops. So you get a crop that you're growing and it's not as nutrient dense as, you should, as it should be. So what do you do? fertilize it, you do this, you do that, but there are ways we're looking at to research this through foliar applications and fertilizers and things like that to increase the nutrient density of crops. How so about soil improvement? Uh, soil improvement, um, uh, at the farm, we've, um, I elected a long time ago not to use animal manures and um, I kind of stayed away from that for particular kind of health reasons and things like that. So we have a vigorous, uh, soil improvement plan, which we use cover crops, crop rotations, and we have um, organic uh, compost, which is leaf compost, and um, we use some organic fertilizers. So we, uh, we're constantly looking at things like that. So uh, in addition to the growing of the food and the, the education, why don't we talk a little bit about the, the marketing and making the connection between the kinds of things you're growing and mm -hmm in getting it to the people yeah. who, who are interested in getting it. Well, yeah, you know, I, I learned early on as a, you know, organic farmer that marketing is 70% of this or 75% of it. So at the farm, we, we, we grow, we have the whole ethnic crop program, which we grow ethnic crops, uh, which uh, right now cater toward the Caribbean and African mar food markets. And um, so just through, um, hopefully we will have a CSA. I like to call it a CSSA which is community shared and supported, okay. which folks will come and help support the farm. And um, just getting the word out and hopefully bringing that food onto campus and providing it to the students first and to the faculty and, um, and staff at UDC first. And then after that, brought into the you know, larger and broader landscape. Is there, um, uh, does the uh, production from the uh, farm is it available at any farmers markets, or can it if will, I were interested in? Coming? It will be this year. It will be this year. I've uh, I've only been on the ground there probably about a year and a couple months, but um, it will be this year. We're gearing toward that, and that's very exciting to really try to get nutrient dense produce into the uh, city. So right now we've servicing um, you know a lot of our food goes to bread for the city, and also um, uh, other places like. Um, DC Central Kitchen, so we, they do get some of our food from time to time. So we're going to implement that more and expand upon that more. Great. Well, thank you so much. So uh, Morgan Morris, um, so you are a seasonal garden coach. So you're in the business. Tell us about Love and Carrots and tell us about how this all got started and, and what your life is like as a garden coach. Okay, well, thank you guys for having me. Um, Love and Carrots got started really just because me and my partner Meredith wanted to grow food in DC. We both have an agrarian background and um, we found that there was a demand for uh, vegetable uh, gardens that wasn't being met well by the nurseries and traditional landscapers. So we uh, rented a truck and started putting in gardens. I think our first garden was in Northwest. Um, and then following that, we are, there's a huge maintenance gap. Um, once you put in the garden, who's going to take care of it? So we came up with a coaching and maintenance program where we work closely with our customers through a season. If they want to do the coaching program, we come for a scheduled time uh, for two hours and uh, work with them in the garden, everything from seeding to harvesting to crop rotations, uh, soil management. We have a composting program where we can use their table scraps and the garden scraps uh, to try to create a whole loop of nutrition in their uh, households. 
And um, yeah, through that, we have a lot of graduates who are doing it themselves now. And then we have uh, people who, who opt just to do the maintenance program where we just come and it's more like a CSA. They get like a CSA box once a week or twice a week, depending on the size of the garden. And uh, it's just straight from their backyard, so it's pretty much zero mile food, <laughs> which is, uh, I think, kind of unique. Um, but yeah, it's, there's a huge growing demand. We're working towards doing bigger projects, bigger uh, farms in the communities, working with developers and local governments, school systems. So it's really just kind of finding our way. <laughs> so there's a, an increasing demand for knowledgeable um, garden coaches? Yeah, definitely. You're hiring? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, we are hiring. Uh, if you have urban agricultural experience, there's, there seems to be a gap in um, the knowledge of generations. Like my grandparents grew up with Victory Gardens, and um, I was lucky enough to grow up as a... Uh, my mom's a landscape architect, so she, she forced me out there. Uh, but uh, there's, there's a, a large gap in people of knowledge gap in how to grow food. And people are really hungry for that right now, especially people of, I think, my generation, early 30s, um, starting new families. They want to do right by their, their children and, and, and be nutritional and, and um, be healthy. So it's... it's it's good. It's a good time to be growing gardens. So talk to me a little bit about, so if I, w I called you up and had you come out and I was interested in taking my whatever plot of land, would you like assess the land and the soil and would you make recommendations on what would be good for me to grow? Or like I used to have a garden in the front yard and I tried to grow corn and, and uh, uh, the squirrels took it all. So how do I, you know, how do you, how do you deal with some of the urban foragers that are out there? So urban foragers are a huge issue. Um, blueberries are amazing, but they're not going to last unless you build a complicated net system around them. Um, but we, we kind of, the, the first start of the process is a consultation where we go to the people's houses, um, check sunlight readings, uh, take a soil sample immediately. Uh, looking for lead or, or other heavy metals in the soil primarily. Um, DC is a swamp, we got clay, so we always amend soils, pretty much. Um, then, then when we go to build a garden, we specialize in raised beds with drip irrigation systems. That's uh, kind of our, our bread and butter, that's uh, what we focus on, so we'll install that. Uh, we have a crop list, we grow somewhere over 400 different varieties of vegetables. Um, so we'll provide that list to the customer and they kind of just check off what they want and they give a range of like, I'm growing a garden because I want tomatoes. So that'll be the focus of the garden. And uh, through the seasons, you know, tomatoes is one season, then they'll also say, I want kale or I want cabbage or collard greens. So that'll be a spring, fall crops. And we kind of just go from there and work the garden around. It's always a, a process to learn how to integrate the garden to the kitchen. So we're, we're pretty hands-on with our customers, a lot of feedback, a lot of um, emails back and forth to make sure that they're getting what they want out of the garden and it's getting used. So if I were like, I can't imagine, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day and you can't take soil that's been out of production for a long time and turn it into full yield in, in, in a season. Are you counseling patients to your clients? How do you how do you talk to them about like taking garden land that hasn't been in production and what's the time frame to getting to a place of full productivity? Well, with raised beds, we bring in uh, a lot of soil. We, we do composting. We, um, so we make a soil mix that, that we treat the soil pretty heavily if we have to, uh, so that we do have pretty good yields first season. But um, I think a lot of what we do is education about the true value of food and how hard it is in urban environments and in general to grow food. So um, our customers, especially the ones that are really engaged, really get a good sense of how hard it is to produce a tomato versus a carrot versus uh, leafy greens and lettuces and things like that. So they really start to get the true value of food. That Then they start to understand like all the inputs that go into it. Um, and it, I think, hopefully changes their perspective when they go to the grocery store, when they go to a restaurant because they can understand how, you know, what that carrot went through that's on the shelf. Great. Great. So, Thomas Forrester at Eco Agriculture Partners, 
your focus is on city region food systems. Could you give us a little background on what is Eco Agriculture Partners and then tell us about your work as in sure. creating city region food systems? Sure, happy to, Dennis. Eco Agriculture Partners is a Washington, D.C. Uh, policy and, and science nonprofit. Uh, it is the secretariat to a, a worldwide initiative called Landscapes for People, Food, and Nature. And it's really about integrated landscape management. And it's primarily rooted in rural landscapes. So we've been hearing about the urban uh, food renaissance, to use Mary Che's term. I think that's very real. And I myself started as an urban gardener at an, an undergraduate student level. Um, the rural side of urban food systems is what I'd like to just emphasize a little bit here. Um, so Eco Agriculture Partners is actually more on the rural side of the urban-rural continuum. Uh, the urban-rural continuum, or nexus as it's increasingly being called in the UN context, is a very, a very hot topic right now. And we can come back to that later. But the local food, regional food, food shed, territorial food systems or food development in Europe, European and Latin American context are all shades of the same uh, like-mindedness about the future of food, which is to say that cities alone can't feed themselves. Cities and their regions can get closer to feeding themselves. And even then, the mega cities of the world are probably always going to be supplied at practically a, a global level. But the balance is way off. And so city region food systems is actually a very new coinage of an international multi-sectors. Uh, it involves many, you can look it up, cityregionsfoodsystems.org is a uh, small website launched in October at the World Committee of Foods on Food Security in Rome uh, following a World Urban Forum call to action, which is also there. The call to action is simply bringing attention to this new uh, framing of, of urban and rural together. And the call is also for a level of integrated planning. So we heard the wonderful initiatives that um, the city council here under Mary Che's leadership is bringing about. And I could say almost every one of those initiatives is also happening in New York, it's where I live. It's happening in other cities around the country and around the world. And typically, it's kind of piecemeal. And we heard uh, Kathleen Merrigan talk about um, the getting beyond silos. And this is true at city government. It's needed at state and federal and even international intergovernmental. Everything is siloed. So you've got agriculture here, health there, economic development there. At every level of go governance, the, the really good news for us is that food is a silo buster. It, it is a very powerful win-win, cross the aisle content area to build coalitions around. So my work now is primarily as a, I work in what a colleague calls the policy garden for the food policy garden and on the architecture of campaigns at all those levels. I teach about it, I work at the UN level, I work at the most local levels, and I work at the federal level. In fact, I can't believe it. I was just remembering that it's 25 years ago that I was working with Kathleen, who was then on the Senate Ag Committee on the Organic Foods Production Act representing farmers. So I come from a production side too, and it's that practice to policy link that is so important to keep alive and why the farmers, as well as the um, supply chain actors or value chain actors, all need to be together there with the consumers, uh, those who are interested in all kinds of other entry points into, which is why the food governance models that are emerging, like food policy councils are so important because they bring all those perspectives together. What's really interesting is that that kind of cross-sector multi-stakeholder environment is happening at the international level right now. And it's being crafted in New York. And this is the last stage 
of a very intense new intellectual environment to push out a new development goal agenda for the world. And what's brand new is sustainable cities on one side. It's a brand new global goal. And what's also very exciting is a commitment to a transformative agenda in agriculture to shift away from fossil fuel based food systems. This is very big. Put the two together, sustainable food systems and sustainable cities, which is not not yet an architecture that's complete, by the way, and you get that need for integrated planning across rural and urban landscapes. This is where groups like EcoAg Partners come in because they know how to bring that down to earth. So, so anyway, one thing I would uh, be interested in um, probing, um, so Jay talked about you know, by mid-century, we're going to be at about nine plus billion globally. But one, one dimension of global demographics that we actually addressed a few years ago in a series on population is that we're also seeing a rapid urbanization. Large numbers of people moving from country to city. That, that something like by mid-century, there will be as, almost as many people in cities as there are alive today. And so that this connection between uh, rural and urban is so important. Are there any examples that you can point to where you're already able to see, you know, whether it's a specific city or region, where you, this kind of activity of linking urban and, and rural together is actually uh, taking hold? Yes, and uh, in an incomplete way. So uh, the arrival of food systems thinking that cuts across uh, many different kinds of initiatives and pulls it together. It's quite new. Uh, new York City Council actually launched FoodWorks New York, which is the first effort to look at a full uh, production to waste and everything in between approach. And how do you understand each of those interventions, policies and programs within a larger context? That seeing it within a larger context and then taking it out rural is very new for municipalities to do. So New York, I'll just stick with where I live for now. Um, there are other examples around the country of cities doing this. New York has a hundred year plus history of uh, investing in the ecosystem services, the term that's used these days. In this case, it's water by owning a, a very large chunk of its watershed and within that watershed there's a lot of agriculture and the management of that agriculture and its uh, practices and their impact on the watershed has been going on for a long time. Taking that to the food system is happening and it's happening through to start with procurement transparency. Where is the food coming into the city from for the roughly 20-25% uh, of the uh, New York City uh, plate, which is $30 billion a year, is a public plate. That means that federal, state, or city dollars touch a huge portion of that plate. So for all of those procurement dollars that the public sector managed or has policy impact on, to put transparency in there to see where it's coming from is the first step. Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, Ivy, Ivy Ken. So you're here at George Washington University, and you're on the faculty. And and uh, Haley used to be one of your students, and you are involved in what raising the awareness of food w uh, with students. And one of your uh, key goals is improving food in schools. Why don't you talk to us about your work and uh, the challenges and what you've been able to do? Well, I'm, I'm very interested in what's going on with school food. And I think the biggest obstacle to having healthy, nutritious, sustainable school food is that we've come to think it's normal for companies to profit off of children's meals. And I'm not talking about modest profit. Um, school meals are a big deal. They're a big part of a sustainable urban food system and national uh, food system. 31 million children a day eat lunch with the National School Lunch Program. And while you and I might think about schools as those places in our neighborhoods where children go 
to learn, uh, companies think about them as markets. Uh, the federal government had $11 billion to spend on the school lunch program last year. And if you are a company that is uh, doing what you're supposed to do, which is maximizing profit in, in service to your shareholders, you would be crazy not to go after um, that market. This has not been good for our kids. It has not been good for our food system or the sustainability of it. It, um, it has brought products onto children's meal trays rather than food, uh, which is the problem that many people here on the panel are, are addressing, but we haven't yet named. And when children get used to products rather than food and they get divorced from the sources of their food and they become acclimated to a diet that fosters obesity, diabetes, and other health problems. And in the meantime, our, uh, our soil is being depleted. We're using fossil fuels. It, it just all adds up to no good. So I think we really have to keep an eye on the companies that are involved in producing, supplying, distributing, um, and even creating products for our, for our kids in schools. So are you, um, have you been able to make change or ch change the dynamic in school systems? For example, there is, I'm aware of a, an organization called Food Corps that's trying to <laughs> change state level rules on foods and to try to reconnect uh, uh, children to gardens and landscapes and, and um, improve the quality of foods. How about, what, what, how about you? Yeah, Food, food Core is a, is a fantastic program. I have two kids in public school here in DC and, and they're so lucky right now because they have a Food Core uh, worker there who is creating a fresh fruit and vegetable farm stand every Friday and things like this. The school is also part of a program called Food Prints uh, which the school has a garden, but then we found over years and years, uh, those of you who are parents will understand this, you, you put in a lot of effort in the garden, you do it for two months, you do it for six months, maybe you even do it for two years, but when you're done doing your work, it kind of falls. And the Food Prince program hires somebody, I think this is a really important part of a sustainable food system, hiring people. <laughs> paying workers to do uh, the jobs that are required to maintain a sustainable food system. So we were able to hire somebody to come in and be the engine of the garden and get the, like uh, Council Member Chase said, get the sweet potatoes into the classroom where they make sweet potato quesadillas with uh, cilantro aioli or, or something like this. Um, so these are really important, and I'm with Thomas as well with the practice policy uh, links, because without a policy like the one Mary Che described, uh, the demand for things like farm to school programs and locally produced goods w would not be there. I, you have to understand what a hard job it is to be a school food service director. You're putting out fires all over the place. You've got to make sure that the food's not too hot, not too cold, that it hasn't been sitting too long, that it doesn't have salmonella. It's a hard job. And then on top of that, we're saying, could you put some locally grown produce in the meals now and then too? It's easy for them and understandable for them to rely on food corporations to say, look, we have this little package of food. It has a nutrition label on it. Pass it out to every kid, there's no mess, you don't have to worry about the nutrition requirements, it's, it's all um, just right there. But without legislation like, like the Healthy Schools Act, which puts in the law, I'm on, I'm on record uh, as having cried the first time I read the Healthy Schools Act, it's so beautiful because it says, <laughs> Farm to school programs will be monetarily rewarded in our public schools. We will pay you extra. The city will reimburse you more as a school if you partake of a farm to school program and get a locally produced fruit or vegetable unprocessed or minimally processed in your kid's lunch every day. 
I think that's a beautiful. That's great. Thing. So that's actually a great segue to Helen Damalis, yeah. of the, um, who's the Policy and Strategic Partnerships Director at the National Farm to School Network. Tell us about yeah. what, you're, what you do. Sure. Thanks, Dennis, and thanks to Food Tank for having me here. Um, yes, that was well said. Um, there is a lot happening on um, farm to school policy in DC and around the country. Um, the National Farm to School Network is an information networking and advocacy hub. Um, so advocacy is really one of the core elements of what we do, but connecting um, communities, farms, schools to farm to school programs. So we've mentioned farm to school a couple times already, just for folks who don't know, farm to school has three core elements. One are school gardens. So getting um, kids' hands dirty, just getting them to have that hands-on experience with food. I thought Councilwoman Che's example earlier was a brilliant one. Um, there is just something that happens to kids when they plant that seed and they watch the carrot or the sweet potato grow and then get to take it into the cafeteria or the classroom and eat it. Um, the second part of farm to school is education. So this can be things like farm tours. So just taking kids out to a farm, getting them to shake the hand of a farmer who produces food for them or bringing a taste test to the classroom. So taking beets that have been grown in the, the school garden and making three different recipes. So kids really get to feel they have a choice and are empowered to make a, a healthy choice for themselves because, because they're part of the process. And then the third part of farm to school is local procurement. So that's the literal farm to school, um, which you just mentioned. So that's actually focusing on supporting family farm incomes by buying local products that are gonna go into the school ca cafeteria. So the National Farm to School Network works um, to connect people to people um, through our network of regional and state leads through a conference we host every other year, connecting people to information so that they have what they need through um, fact sheets and monthly webinars in that conference to actually then go start farm to school um, activities on the ground and then our advocacy efforts at the federal and state level to really bolster and support um, just has been mentioned, uh, legislation like what's happened in D.C. to really grow farm to school programs. So um, you're a national uh, program. Could you talk, you did talk about D.C., but are, are there areas where you've been able to make a big difference or are there regions of the country where you've been able to actually uh, make a difference with the, your presence more than in others and where are places that you'd love to be able to make more progress than you have? Great question, yeah. So um, I very vaguely mentioned um, that the National Farm to School Network, of course, we are a network. So we have a small national staff, so we really um, rely on the incredible resources of our 51, so 50 states plus a DC state leads, and then our eight regional leads. Um, we have divided the country into eight regions. And I encourage all of you, if you have not already, to connect with these folks. So we rely on them to really um, be the kind of boots on the ground to help implement these farm to school activities. Um, it's a farm to school is a grassroots community based movement. So we started with a handful of programs in the late 90s. Um, as of last year, USDA's farm to school census, first time ever census, showed that we now have more than 40,000 schools spending over $385 million, yes, um, on local products. Um, it started in California and farm and, and Florida, and we've seen the farm to school movement now grow. Um, New England has had a lot of success. They've really focused on taking farm to school to farm to institutions, so bringing in hospitals, bringing in colleges um, and universities, really trying to expand that institutional level. Um, I think that in terms of your question about where might we need to focus more efforts, one area would be the South. You know, it was mentioned by the councilwoman earlier that um, one of the key issues around all of this is the obesity epidemic and um, diet-related diseases. And so we're seeing that um, there's a strong demand for farm to school programs in the South right now. We know the research shows that when kids are involved in farm to school programs, they actually eat more servings of fruits and vegetables, which makes sense. If they're growing it, if they're meeting the farmer, then they're gonna be excited and eat those foods. So we're really excited to ramp up our work in the South um, and then also in tribal communities. There's a strong demand from tribal communities, similarly um, with the South because of diet related diseases to really to grow food and to get kids involved in the food system. Great, thank you. So Haley, you're a senior here at George Washington University. Uh, you serve on the GW Urban Food Task Force. Could you tell us what that is and what it does and what you achieve? Um, well, the Urban Food Task Force is run by Diane Knapp and um, it's a combination of faculty and students uh, to talk about how we can do sustainable things on campus related to food. Uh, so my role, um, 
I'm the manager of the Grow Garden on campus. So it's a 2,700 square foot garden. Um, we grow food and we donate it all to Miriam's Kitchen. Um, so I think my main interest in that and I think the main success in that is um, creating knowledge for both students and people who are walking by the garden every day. Um, I think the main problem in our food system, one of the main problems is uh, the lack of intimacy with our food, the lack of knowledge that we have, or even the ability to have knowledge about where our food comes from. Um, whether you're a GW student or a homeless person walking by the garden, uh, a lot of people walk by and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea that a tomato looked like that on the vine. Um, so people don't understand where their food comes from and therefore don't understand how it's produced. Um, and if we were to produce food in a city, I think that uh, food would be produced dramatically different than the way it's produced in rural areas, uh, such as with pesticides, a lot of chemical inputs, that sort of stuff. We wouldn't want that around us. Or even what we're growing. Um, if you left, uh, like I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, for example. And uh, to understand where my food comes from, um, as a child, the closest farm is corn. And it's not really where my food comes from. That's on my plate. So how do I understand what my food looks like if uh, we're not even growing the things that we put on our plate? So how uh, you're a very articulate uh, advocate for this transformation. What drew you to this? What was, uh, how, how did you get involved in all this? Um, well, this started for me in high school, actually. Uh, I think as kind of every high school girl goes through that stage where she's really self-conscious and wants to be more nutritionally aware. And so I started becoming interested in like calories and protein and that kind of stuff. And then I started reading um, and realizing that the most important thing for my health is the way the world around me and is and the way those things affect my body, not in a numerical way, but more in a holistic way. And so um, I tried to figure out where my food was coming from and I realized, like I mentioned, it's all corn around me and what is growing and how do I get involved with that? So then I came to GW and uh, the first student org I joined was the Food Justice Alliance and got my hands in the soil and here I am. So this idea though of legacy, um, you're a senior now and you're, you've been very active in raising the profile of food here. So how does, I assume you're heading off to graduation and to uh, help ch change the world. So who, <laughs> who carries, how do you, who carries on the work? That's really hard. Um, you know, there's students leaving every year. Uh, and I've been really lucky to have someone who, you know, was a year ahead of me and taught me everything as I went along. And um, I'm trying to do the same for a few students, but it's hard. We, I don't know what will happen. I could leave and everything could <laughs> stop, which would be really heartbreaking. But um, So you do have some mentees you're trying to bring along. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Right. Right. <laughs> So uh, Tom Calicchio, so um, in addition to what I had mentioned earlier, um, Tom was also executive producer of the film A Place at the Table. And um, uh, if you have not seen it, you must. It's, it's a very powerful film about hunger in America. I can say that uh, uh, after sawing, seeing that film, it uh, made me push to publish an article in National Geographic on hunger in America, and I thank you for uh, that inspiration. Um, you uh, are, in addition to your um, work as a chef and as an author, you're also uh, trying to change the landscape of food in New York City. Why don't you talk a bit about that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> just quickly going to the film, um, if, if you haven't seen it, there's, there's one scene and uh, I, I think it's uh, um, it's, my, it's one of my favorite scenes in the film where we're in Mississippi and there's a, a teacher um, who was diagnosed with diabetes and she decides that she doesn't want to go on medication she wants to change her diet and then she decides to take um, sort of what she's sort of teaching herself about food and bring it to the classroom and there's a scene where she has a melon and these kids have never seen a melon and she cuts it up and you just see the, the, the students light up 
Um, and then the, the, and the idea was that after that, they would go home and teach their parents um, and tell them that they want healthier food. And you know, you, you, I, I didn't plan on, on coming here today. I found myself in DC last night and uh, decided to attend because I, I, I would want to be in the audience and listen. So I have a great front row seat right here and listening to, <laughs> to so, many, so many great things. Um, but, um, uh, and so I was, I was, I'm only here till 12 o'clock, so I had to go on one of the first two panels, and, and, and so this, this made perfect sense. But, and, 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 and I say there that kind of half jokingly, but you know, I thought about it, and I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and um, my grandfather um, was an urban gardener. And it wasn't until um, we started working on a project in New York to, to grow uh, in New York that I, I realized this. He would grow tomatoes, zucchini, and peppers, um, and a few other things in five gallon milk, five, five gallon containers. Um, he would just load it up with soil and he grew. And so from a young age, I, I sort of watched things grow in, a, in an urban setting. I never much thought about it. We, I assumed every grandfather did this. This is what my grandfather was doing. Um, and uh, my grandfather was also a forager. He, um, he worked for, for PSE and G, it's the, the utility service in New Jersey, and he was a, a truck driver. And he would, uh, when they were putting power lines up in northern New Jersey, he would go foraging for mushrooms and stuff. And, and uh, would, would come home and, and cook them up. And um, it was kind of interesting, because I always remember he had a, a, a method for figuring out whether or not they were poisonous or not. And he, he, would, he, he would put a little water in, in, in a pan and put some of the mushrooms in there and put a penny in the nickel. And he said, if any of them turned colors, and he knew they were poisonous. And my grandfather's no longer with us, but I don't, <laughs> it, 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 wasn't, it, wasn't the mushroom, it wasn't the mushrooms that did it. Um, but um, <coughs> uh, my mother also ran a school lunch program. Um, in, in, in uh, New Jersey as well. And I remember her, um, she was getting a little older and complaining that she was always tired and we were trying to get her to retire. And uh, you know, I never thought much about the job that she was doing. Uh, I mean, I, occasionally I would pop in to see her when I was in school and um, uh, I always knew that if I got in trouble, I was really in trouble because they would take me to her, not the principal. And so, um, but um, when I was trying to get her to retire, she, she said, you know, I'm not ready yet. That's my, you know, uh, it, it, you know, I think it's time. I assume she was going there for, you know, social social time at school. But she she kind of uh, floored me with with her response, and it I always remember this. And she said, "I know if I leave, I fight every day to bring fresh produce into this school cafeteria." And this is going back in the '80s. Fight every single day. I know if if I leave, this is going to go completely institutional. And again, never thought much about it when she said this, but then. Later on in life, it always, it always sort of stuck with me. And, and, and so um, how, you know, and I think, I think you know, with, what's going on here at the school and what's going on at so many schools, how do you connect kids back to how do we grow things, what food's about, why it's important? Not only why it's important for nutritional reasons, but, but the, the social aspect of eating together, which is pretty much gone from society these days. I mean, when I was a kid, I had to be home at a certain hour for dinner. And so how does food connect um, not only our, our, our ability to sustain ourselves uh, through better nutrition, uh, to answer the obesity question, um, but, but how, how, do, how do we create more of a, a social fabric around food as well? Um, which is why I started, um, I say we, I should say we, started gardening in, in New York. And it, it, it kind of happened as a, as a conversation, let's, let's grow a few things just to try to see what, you know, what happens and not, not expect too much. And um, we, we were working on a project. It didn't happen on a, on a roof um, for various reasons. We couldn't do it. And then about five years ago, we got involved in a project on the east side. It's a restaurant called River Park. And it's a, a, a large development. It's a life science building. Um, and there was the, the uh, plan was to build three towers. And the first tower went up, and that's where the restaurant was. And we were trying to work out another deal to build, to, to put a garden on a garage um, uh, rooftop. And someone from the organization, the developer, realized that, and this is some type of policy works, uh, and it was our good fortune. Um, they decided not to break ground on the second tower because of the economy. And they found that if, um, uh, there was a, a, a policy for, for stalled um, construction projects. And so if you actually repurposed that land, um, you were able to keep your, um, your permits in place. 
so you didn't have to go reapply. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was uh, about three years that passed between the, when they had the permit for the, for, the, for the property and they actually built. So they actually did build. But, so we, we went to them and said, listen, how about, how about a farm? How about a working garden? Um, and we worked with Grow NYC and we developed a system. Um, we grow in milk crates. We have 8,000 milk crates. We have a burlap, a burlap sack in the milk crate. There's soil. There's irrigation. Last year, we grew about 25 tons of food. Um, this is inside of the, uh, the, the East River, overlooking the, the, the highway. Um, and it's completely changed the way that, that you see the cooks, in, in, you know, they have to go out there and, and tend the garden. But you see the way they interact with food. And so to me, it's just a, it, it's a, a, a a good example on how policy can actually jumpstart some of these ideas. But uh, it, it's, it's also a ton of work. Um, and so we're talking, we're talking about large companies and how they can exploit the $11 billion uh, 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 sort of food and lunch um, budget. But at some point, how do we turn these urban gardens into a business? Because it's, at a certain point, they, they, it can't be sort of Fun and games. How, how do we do it? So Morgan's figured out how to make a business out of it. Um, and so, but how, how, do, how do we make businesses out of this? How do we actually create these environments where, where um, we can grow and, and, and people can actually make a living? Um, because this is why people are living, leaving farms. This is why they're leaving rural areas. They can't make a living in farms anymore. They're coming to the city. So how can they use what they know, what they sort of grew up with, and actually create a, a, a model um, for, for business? So they can sell the restaurants, so they can sell the schools. Um, and then what role does government play? How does government create the markets? How do they mandate that for the school lunch system a certain amount of it has to be local? And so now farmers, and if they're really local, and cities can actually use this as, as a business opportunity uh, so as well. So great, Tom. Uh, you, you, uh, we could go on forever, but we are running short of time. But one thing I think is what you've already started to do now is I'm interested for just a few minutes before we open to Q&A, uh, I would like to begin to have that conversation amongst you. Imagine that you are all gathered around the campfire. We've been talking here this way, but now let's talk amongst ourselves. I mean, imagine seven very motivated, passionate people who are interested in making change in urban food systems and food systems. What do you guys have to say to each other? If you guys were in a room together and you wanted to come up with some new thing or wanted to make a difference, what, what, what do you have to say to each other about uh, what you're doing and how maybe you could work together. Don't be shy. Uh, Thomas? Uh, well, I would, I would uh, actually... We'll do the lightning round, like 30 seconds, okay? <laughs> okay, all right. I, I think the fact that your University of uh, District of Columbia is a land-grant school is actually very significant. And uh, I think the, the you know, dominant policy signals on both the supply and the demand side really are about an agriculture that has been uh, directed towards vertical integration and industrialization, et cetera. Um, and the land grant system is in a very key place to influence new directions in agriculture. So I would, I would ask if you are working within the land grant university community to actually push a different model, if you will. How about you, Che? Uh, well, yeah, you know, we are because, um, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, my assistant dean at the college, uh, William Hare, when he goes out to these places, these land-grant colleges in Penn State and Cornell and, you know, talk to these folks and they're understanding that we are urban land-grant college and we're looking at doing investigation and research and trying to push policy toward urban agriculture. This is something that they are really not even sometimes really looking at. So we're starting that conversation. So it's very important. So, um, and um, the bill that, you know, in combination with the bill that uh, uh, Mary Che, uh, Councilperson Che has uh, started is, is extremely important. I mean, that's, that's huge. That's huge to have that, you know, implemented in a, in a place where you can really, you know, where folks can grow food and then make a living. I mean, that's, I started off as a, you know, urban farmer. I, I'm, not, I'm a third generation Washingtonian, but uh, I started off as a small urban farmer before I went back to 
uh, College of Agronomy. So, um, and that, but I was selling. I went into it selling, and I, my business partner was a chef, and he said, "Hey, man, let's sell this stuff to the, to the restaurant." So we did, and um, you know that policy is, which is started and structured and to the university. So there's a you know we we are a very good starting point, an excellent starting point. Great. Okay, Ivy, how about you? Uh, lightning round. Quick. Yeah. Well, I. I I'd like to pick up on what, what Tom said there, too, about n needing to be able to make a business out of providing good, fresh, local fruits and vegetables to people. Right, we're, we're, people can't just do this out of the goodness of their hearts. They often do have really good hearts and are doing it for what we might consider to be the right reasons. But at the end of the day, right, they've got families to provide for and they have to be able to do that. So I might propose something that would sound a little bit counterintuitive uh, in our current uh, uh, situation. Not scaling up, <laughs> keeping it local, keeping it regional, understanding what is going on in the ecosystem of your local area, and making it work for the community, making it work for the people who are doing the work of providing and preparing um, the food and getting it to kids and to families and letting that be enough. Great. Okay. Uh, Morgan, how about you? Um, yeah, in terms of not scaling up, we're definitely locally focused and, um, you know, we want to do bigger projects, but we, we want to do bigger projects in D.C. and the metro area and we want to focus on this area that's growing, that's excited about this prospect. Um, providing jobs for our urban farmers, I think we have eight urban farmers on staff this season coming up. That's extremely exciting. Um, I am so proud of them and they are so good. Mo we have 100% return from last season. It's you know always hard to keep it rolling in a seasonal position, but they are amazing people. They love to do what they do. They love to engage our customers. Um, they're all fairly young and uh, have multiple years of experience in, in farming, both rural and local. Uh, we've really been able to tap into some of the nonprofit uh, educational groups that, like EcoCity and uh, other places that train, basically, and we hire. <laughs> That's, it's, it's an amazing system. Okay, great. Helen? Yeah, great question. Um, we all, I think most of us have talked about the importance of enriching connections between people and their food. So I think what I would say is that we need to think about who perhaps is not part of this small um, fireside conversation or in this room, aside from the 1,500 people who wanted to be here. Um, because when we think about food, you know, as you said earlier, Thomas, it is a silo buster. Um, we say that farm to school is a triple win for kids, farmers, and communities. We're really at the intersection of so many sectors from the environment to agriculture to health and the economy. But I think what I am curious um, for us in the movement to think about is who may not already be at the table um, in terms of the economy. So have we connected with the Department of Labor or have we reached out to mental health agencies who might be interested in how growing food, kids growing food or families growing food can improve mental health outcomes. So really thinking about new and innovative partners that might not already be part of the so-called movement to enrich the connection that we all have to food. Great. Thank you. Haley? Um, I've been thinking uh, this whole time, well, this is like a first great step, is networking with each other, although yeah, you mentioned not being with the people at the table, but utilizing the people at the table. Um, and you know, I could use maybe knowledge from Love and Carrots, and maybe it'd be great if the university farms connected, and we learn from each other and utilize each other's skills um, and knowledge to create more wholesome things, maybe not scale up, but more uh, stronger. Great, thank you. Anything to add, Tom? Yeah, one, one thing, it's just a, a word of caution, I guess. Um, when we were taking the film around, um, we would you know, usually show, us, you know, show, show the film and we do a Q&A. And at, at every single Q&A, someone raised their hand and say, why can't hungry people just grow their own food? And so this is all, this conversation is great to have, but I would just, I would just sort of keep your antenna up for that kind of that, that language, that question, because this is, again, I, 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 I'm involved in, in urban gardening, but it will not feed 47 million people who can't feed themselves. That's right. Uh, it can help. Uh, it's great when you're, when you're growing things in, in, in community gardens and it gets donated to food banks. 
Um, there's, there's always a, an issue. Of, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. There you go. There we go. Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. No, there it is. Okay. Um, and so um, it, it's great where uh, community gardens and, and urban gardens, actually some, uh, some of the food is being donated to food banks. Um, it's great for food banks because typically they don't have a lot of fresh produce. Um, but I, I don't want to give anyone the impression that this can take care of the hunger issue that we have in this country. Um, and, and it's just a... A, a caution because I, I don't and I haven't seen evidence that it can um, and I, it's just a, 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 a I think we need to, to constantly be aware of this because this isn't a solution um, you know there's always the, the constant sort of cut 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 we just cut 8.9 billion dollars out of the food stamp program this will not make up for 8.9 billion dollars of, of cuts um, it's it's great from an educational standpoint it's great to connect people back to food it, it, it's, you know, once we make those connections, we can sort of hopefully help address the obesity issue. But um, I, I would just, just be, be careful um, with, with that. That's, that's, that's All right, it. great. But so this we're is, I'm just, this is, is great. We need more farm coaches. That's what we need. A lot more farm coaches. I, I, I put a, a garden in my house, and uh, I, I was lucky to have a friend of mine who helped me out. Um, the other thing I would also say is it's not cheap. It, it's really not cheap to start a garden. Um, and so, again, the impression is that uh, you just get some seeds and you throw them in the ground and that's it. And we all know that's not, that's not what it takes. And so, uh, uh, but this, is, this has been great, yeah. Great, thank you. So questions? I'm, since we're the first of the day, I'm not sure what the protocol is. So uh, how about you, ma'am, in a row five? Yes, ma'am. Here comes a mic for you. Thank you, Mary Kimball, Center for Land-Based Learning, Northern California. I would like to follow up on the point that, that Chef uh, Tom made about the businesses and offer a potential another solution. We run beginning farmer programs, California Farm Academy, and I would like to suggest to all of you, including farm to school folks, that beginning farmers need new places, they need land access. And one of the best places to start those new farms could be in urban situations. We've, we've partnered, for example, with the city of West Sacramento for public land as well as private land, where they can then start their own farming enterprises, their own businesses, value-added opportunities. One of them is in the back of a school. So it's that sustainability issue from the focus of not having to hire somebody. It's actually somebody who's a farmer who's farming that two acres that then can connect in with all of the education and opportunities and curriculum at that school. Okay, thank you. And I have a question for Tom, which is, how can chefs be a part of this urban agriculture dialogue in terms of building the kinds of work and sustainability in communities that you'd like to see? Chefs, we, we, are, we are the market. Um, you know, we, we buy a tremendous amount of, 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 of produce. And so um, I, I, would, I would suggest that you, for your urban farmers that are, are looking to break into market and sell their stuff, reach out to restaurants. The first place you should go. Um, selling to the public is much more difficult. I mean, you can go to a farm stand. You have to spend, you know, the entire day there. You've got to get everything there. Or you can make one big drop off to a restaurant. And so uh, chefs are, are a, a very open, uh, very open to, to this. It happened for a while. Okay, great. So look, we're running short of time, so we need to pick up the pace. You in the front row, please. Short questions and short answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Ajay Markande. I'm from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, I just wanted a quick uh, reaction to Tom Foster's uh, comment there. Um, the thing is that it, uh, the uh, advocacy analysis and results on food-based systems has been around for an awful long time, especially in organizations like myself. Um, uh, like mine. Uh, the issue has been largely to translate all this advocacy and evidence and results into political uh, policies and, and dialogues on governance, etc. So my question is actually very simple. What, what is your evidence that things are changing and what is, why do you feel that the political landscape is changing? Uh, in my own estimation, the silo approach is still very strong. Thank you. Okay, Thomas. I will try to be very, very brief. That's a, that's a question it could take us in many directions. However, the, the, the climate that I described in which uh, there is a push for integrated development goals that actually meet uh, local and subnational authorities differently 
than the last generation of Millennium Development Goals is why I, I'm excited partly by, uh, for example, there's not been in the past as effective a bridge between the Agency for Cities and the Agency for Food, the Rome-based agencies for, for food, that's UN Habitat and the FAO, WFP, and, and EFED. That's improving, and it's partly because of this climate. Uh, that's an example to me of the, the silo busting at the most international level, but it's also being pushed from the bottom up. The demand for integration is coming not from within these large institutions, but from the bottom up, which is really why I think this place-based approach is so important to get it together and then push it out. But that's different than scaling up. I just want to say that that example sharing and needing the policy to embrace local innovation is, is uh, I, I, I do think there's movement. But OK, great. Yeah. So we have online questions. I will ask them and see who wants to jump. It uh, is consumer choice the answer. How do we change the big companies that billions of producers and consumers rely on? So. I think consumer choice is the answer. I mean, part, part of what we're talking about in terms of local, regional, and seasonal um, food is that you also have to get used to eating local, regional, and seasonal food. And when you're on your fourth CSA box of beets, carrots, and potatoes, you have to be. Uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, and, and some Swiss chard in here might be where chefs can also help, help us educate us with this because chefs are good at using seasonal ingredients in their cooking. So consumer choice, uh, I'm not so sure that's our answer. OK. Any, uh, um, you far left over there. Wait for the mic, please. Hi, uh, Jeremy Kranowitz with Sustainable America. Um, a lot of us in the room know the story of Will Allen in Milwaukee and what he's been able to do. And it seemed like there was an element there of being able to use um, indoor agriculture and abandoned lots or, or buildings that cities are on the hook to manage, and wondered if that was an aspect that, um, that folks had considered or if there was a particular challenge in trying to scale that up in our industrial urban cores. All right, thank you. Who wants to take that? We've looked into that. It's a, it's a hard thing. It's a marketing thing where if we're going to put the capital into it, how we're going to get the investment out, finding investors for that area. As uh, you guys have alluded to, it's not cheap building gardens. It's not cheap building aesthetically pleasing gardens um, with hardscapes and irrigation and all the management that goes into it. So it's a, it's a, I think it's a monetary issue to get started. And then there's tons of avenues it could go in. Anybody else? Quickly. Or Quickly, I would just say that uh, there's a similar caution to the one uh, Chef Tom gave us about hungry people can feed themselves. I think uh, there are very few cities and countries that have budgeted how much land it takes to grow to feed themselves. One example is the Netherlands, which came to the conclusion that it would take four countries the size of the Netherlands to feed the Netherlands. It does take that. So I think there's a lot of fascination with verticalizing agriculture in urban environments that I, I, I think it's, it's a distraction at one level, but a very exciting exercise of uh, energy and technology at another level. So it's not an either or, but let's be balanced. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so I want to thank our wonderful panel and all of you for being here. Please stick around for the next two days. It's an incredible program coming up. Thank you all.